Hi, I'm Ann Munchler with Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here at Cadence to talk with Adam Shearer about simulation, how it's changed over the past 40 years, and what is new. So Adam, simulation, a stalwart of EDA design. Tell us about how it has changed, what's new, and where we're headed. A absolutely. So simulation has been part of the day-to-day uh, -day lives of verification design engineers, as we were saying, for 40 years. And, and granted, in those early years, in fact, for many of the first two decades, it was primarily Verilog, VHDL, RTL. And we all know of the uh, changes in language support, assertions, system Verilog, e-language, system C, all of these things that have come about. But we've also seen new technologies, new verification capabilities, new engines, formal analysis, hardware capabilities, uh, emulation, FPGA prototyping, all of these elements. And we get these questions from time to time from customers, from press, from everyone, saying, well, wh where is simulation going? Uh, is simulation still relevant? And certainly, I would have to say, yes, it, it absolutely is. But that's not a sufficient answer. The, the, the answer really needs to be why. How is it staying relevant? Is it simply relevant because, well, we've done this forever? Or is it relevant because there are really new things that we've added that keep the relevance for new industries, new technologies, and new scaling? Adam, can you walk us through some of the new ways that simulation is being used today? Uh, absolutely. So, um, uh, so I'm actually going to start from the applications where it's sort of continuous use. We'll start there, and then we're going to move into some of the new capabilities responding to industry pressure. So if I start from how is it being used new today, right? So let's start with the UVM, uh, UVM-based environment. Arguably, that's not really new, right? We've had ERM, OVM, UVMs now going on. 10 plus years of this type of methodology. But where are the, where, where's the newness? Well, well, some of the newness is really just the sheer volume of simulation that's being run, right? These technologies, the test bench uh, has enabled engineers to run tens or hundreds of simulations from their, the tests that they create. They add new seeds and this can generate an enormous amount of simulation. So the simulator needs to keep up with this. And it's, it's not enough just to run the language. We need to be able to run it fast. So recognizing common patterns. So uh, UVM is a software language, effectively. Um, it's got objects. It's got methods. It's got untimed execution. Well, this is different than the core engine has had for those 40 years. The core engine built, is built on static design structure. So we've made optimizations in the test bench as well as in the design of the test, the, the static parts. But the dynamic parts are truly interesting and there's so much opportunity for reducing memory. Uh, you know, a simple thing like inlining. Right? C uh, compilers have inlined short functions for a long, long time. Right? We can do that now in simulation. It's not that the engineer needs to create a macro to assure that it's in line, the simulator is going to recognize that and inline that function. And you get better performance in areas where there's high repeated use of function calls, as an example. So the engine itself has to keep up with performance, even if that environment is you know, a common use model. Adam, can you draw some of this out for us on the board? A absolutely. So you know, one of the things to very easily talk about building off of a UVM environment would be uh, protocols that have a programming segment to them. So you know, PCI Express is an example of uh, that type of protocol. And so I've drawn that up here. And, and the question is, how do we get truly meaningful cycles in our regression? When we do a programming segment, this may run for a few hours uh, at a time, even a half an hour significant period of time, if we're running hundreds of tests, we're rerunning this programming segment again and again. And that's, that's an expensive process in simulation. It, it consumes resources, whether they're on-premise compute or cloud-based compute. 
it takes a lot of time. What we prefer to be able to do is rather than run each of these tests here uh, with a, a new test each time, right? ideally what we would do is we'd run that programming sequence once and then from that programming sequence we'd start each of these tests. T1, T2, T3. So here, where each of these would consume, let's say, a, a full workstation, and this, this uh, time here might be measured, say, two hours. Right? By three, we have six hours of simulation, possibly across three workstations. Here, we may have 90 minutes to start. And then each of these tests may be 30 minutes in length. But now we can begin to uh, sequence them on the same machine. There are a number of things we might do so that using a save and restore capability, it might be 90 plus three, these three get us to a three hour time. Right? In this case, the total regression shrinks depending upon your resource utilization. That could either be cutting the regression in half or cutting the resource in half. And it could be some combination, but you now have a flexibility for throughput you didn't have before. And this is critical for these types of long programming or long reset sequence IP or subsystems. So Adam, that is a great perspective on IP, on the IP side of things. What about for big, huge designs? So excellent question. Um, and for very large designs for SOC, it's really everything. We have to do everything because these things are so big and they run so long. For the RTL side of SOC integration, right, these are tests that run continuously through a project um, for the three, six months that we have for system integration. The gate level tests, which is a form of SOC verification, tend to come at the end, tend to come before tape out, and any delays can mean weeks of re-simulation just to uh, get through that full regression. So it's a big problem. Obviously, performance optimization in the core engine is critical. But some of these designs, as they reach billion gate and larger, the build time, just elaborating that design together to start a simulation run, can be measured in hours almost even a full day. So we have an example where uh, a very large scale SOC like this might take as much as uh, 10 hours simply to build it. Now, moving from our older simulator incisive to Excelium, we were able to reduce this down to three and a half. But the question really becomes turnaround time. So at three and a half hours plus a simulation, an engineer might be able to get one or two cycles in during a workday. Um, that's not a lot. So what we want to be able to do is take a look at this design. And what I've tried to show here is that there's one block that's actually under design and, and change. So this PCIe block amongst all the other IP is the one that's undergoing an edit and, and build. So arguably, if I can manage to draw this picture simply, most of this is static. All right, so really what we want to be able to do is only elaborate just the one block. All right, again, where's, this technique isn't new. All right, this is what we've been doing with C language forever. Since the linker was invented uh, uh, in 1973, we've been doing we've been linking object files, right? Yes, we have dynamic object files. There's been technology advanced since the beginning. But in our space, there's a lot of complexity here, right? Because remember, a moment ago we said performance, right? I have highly optimized this. I have found places to share resource, to share memory, to line up the simulation so this goes as fast as possible. If I carve out this one block, what happens to my performance optimization. Well, 
with the incremental elaboration capability in Excelium, we maintain that performance. So what you've got here from a monolithic or a single build, you can get here from an incremental. The difference is that this might only take two minutes to rebuild. That's where it's different. Now, can you use this incremental elaboration for IP and subsystem? Yes. But typically, the size of the incremental piece and the main portion are similar. So your gain might be smaller, 1.3x, 2x. It follows an Amdahl's law of uh, what part is static, what part is changing. But this allows us to handle uh, designs that are greater than a billion gates in size, even in simulation. How do you do that in the tool? What had to change within the structure of the tool itself to do so that? that? That's a, a really good question because it's extremely complex, right? The uh, simulator optimizes heavily in traditional simulation for a single core of execution. We can talk about multi-core in a moment. But for that single core of execution, we have optimizations that look to flatten and trace signals across the whole thing. What had to change is we needed to understand not just the signal interface between these two, but the potential optimizations across. Can we maintain them all? No, uh, we can't. All right? So there may be as much as a 10% overhead because we're not able to maintain the full optimization across. But if the simulation uh, from here, if your simulation runtime was 10 hours plus your three and a half, you're at a 12, 13 hour cycle. Now you can only turn around twice in a 24 hour period. Start in the morning and your engineers are working 12 hours, I'm scaring my audience. But here, I might be able to turn around twice in the workday. And those types of cycles dramatically change how we can run uh, and, and test these devices. So Adam, that is for a single core. What about when it comes to multi-core? Because we see so many of those designs today, obviously. And what we've been doing is we've been trying to um, work with customers to understand where do we best apply single core execution and multi-core execution. And really it comes down to uh, two main viewpoints uh, in simulation. Uh, IP high volume regression and long latency tests. And there really are these two groupings. So if I have a, a server with multiple cores, and I'll just draw a few of them here, um, you can imagine this having 28, in case of an ARM-based server, 32, 48 cores. How do we maximize utility on that server? Well, in an IP verification, right, and these are tests that are running a few minutes, like um, uh, CPU-based verification, or CPU verification of CPUs might be millions of uh, few seconds to few minute tests. Um, more complex designs might have IP that runs a few minutes, 30 minutes, uh, an hour in length. Well, the load uh, balancing tools will put uh, a job per core. And that's going to give us great throughput in that system because we're highly utilizing the CPU, the um, server. The multi-core applications are best fit for long latency big tests like these. A test like this is so big in terms of memory that it's going to consume the memory footprint or most of it associated with a server. So what we want to be able to do is to say, okay, we're going to take the memory associated with multiple cores. The cores would otherwise be idle, and we're going to use that to speed up simulation. Whether it's an RTL simulation, a gate level, a gate with timing, those types of sims that run for hours, days, even weeks in length, that's where the multi-core engine in any form is best suited. So for the, uh, apologize for writing here so much, but uh, the IP level tests are great in single core. These long latency, that's really where the multi-core fits the best, knocking down those long sims. So when we're waiting for a tape out, 
and we've got an ECO at the end of a project, and we have to rerun all of our date functional tests, our design for test tests, the DFT tests, uh, anything with timing, right? That sequence of regression, first of all, it's going to find the biggest, most expensive servers we've got because of the memory and the performance required. But that regression may take two or three weeks to run if we were doing it single core. If we can take that down to a week, a few days, it's a dramatic improvement, especially toward the end of a cycle. All right? and so that's where these technologies best apply. Thanks, Adam, for telling us all about what's happening with simulation and how performance gains are being had today. So thanks, Anne. This has been great. I love speaking about simulation, been working with it for a very long time. The concept that this technology is static, far from true. Giving you a few examples here of new technologies, new capabilities in the engines, but there's a lot more. There's power with X propagation. Mixed signal is a huge topic that I like to dig into. Maybe that's something that we can come back to and more. The work that we're doing in simulation is, is phenomenal. And this technology will be center for verification for many years to come.